And all of a sudden, Columbus are cruising. The crew in control and into the conference final. Columbus have done it. What are we doing? Hello everyone, I'm Taylor Twalman and this is Banter. I'm here to get you ready for the kickoff of the Easter Conference Final between the Columbus Crew and the New England Revolution over on ABC at 3 o'clock Eastern. Joining us today will be Giazzi Zardes and Tejan Buchanan to find out how each team is doing ahead of that game. But first, I want to bring in two gentlemen that I have a huge amount of respect for and they will get you up to date into this busy month of American soccer. Stu Holden of Fox Sports. Paul Tenorio of The Athletic. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Stu, I want to start with you. I know you've done majority of your games out west, but I want to get your perspective about today's game, Columbus versus New England. Just initially, are you surprised at all that this is the conference final? Yeah, I mean, how can you say not? I know we can. you could say, this is MLS, uh, but you have an eight seed in the New England Revolution that have made it all the way there. And yes, this is Bruce Arena's team, but we covered... Uh, one of their games early, the playoff, the, the playing game against the Montreal Impact. And I didn't see a revolution team at that moment that I thought could go to the conference final. Now, the big difference, Taylor, and I know you're a big fan of this guy, is Carlos Heel. They got him back right at the end of the season. And boy, has he changed this team completely. Uh, just opening up space for guys like Bo and Buxa. Buchanan has looked a real threat from right back. And quite frankly, I feel like the New England Revolution are going to go into Columbus and get the victory. This is the team that is red hot right now, and I don't think it's a team that the crew want to play. Yeah, and Stu, you bring up a very interesting point about Carlos Hill because I don't think they're your typical eight seed. If he was there for majority of the year, I don't think we're talking about them as an eight seed. But I want your opinion whether or not you agree or disagree with me. Carlos Hill, top five player in Major League Soccer, yes or no? Yes. I, I mean, h hands down. I, I'm with you. I know you've been pumping that one for, for a while now. And when he went down and, and was injured for the revolution, now they thought he was going to be out a lot longer than he actually ended up being. What a bonus for them to get him back and healthy. Because really, when he's playing at this type of level, and we saw it uh, at the tail end of 2018 as well, I mean, he, he has such an ability to open the game up. He's up there with the best passers in the league. And you talk about just total impact on a team. That's how I judge players when it comes to Major League Soccer. And he's a top five player in this league. Paul, I invited Stu to disagree with me. So mark that down. <laughs> that will be the first and only time that Stu and I agree. But I want to bring you in here because a major surprise this week. I know Stu was surprised. I know I was surprised. Greg Vanny out of Toronto. What's the latest? And when do we expect the Galaxy to announce him? <laughs> well, this was a very difficult decision from what I was told for Greg Vanny. And, um, you know, I was actually, I, I assumed that this was a move that just um, was going from Toronto to the Galaxy. But I was told this was more of a personal decision for Greg Vanny. He needed a break. He needed to step away from the job. We saw in his press conference, he talked about he likes to build and there's not much building left to, to do in Toronto. I think we can also point out to the fact that there's a, there are a lot of power brokers in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Bill Manning, the president, Ali Curtis, the general manager, and Greg Vanny, you know, he wants to have a say in what's happening in the soccer operations as well. So I think that factored in. But what I have been told is there have been no discussions, zero discussions between Greg Vanny and the LA Galaxy to this point. So if it happens, and it would make a lot of sense for it to happen, it's going to take a while. Yeah, but Greg Vanny needs to be very careful here. I understand the mental break and taking a break, but there's never been a time in Major League Soccer where you have three high-profile jobs waiting there, and you just left one of them. Now, I'll argue with anyone that Toronto's more high-profile than the Galaxy because the Galaxy right now is a bigger project, as Stu Holden said on Fox Sports midweek. I completely agree with that. I want to go to Atlanta United. Heinze looks like a done deal to Atlanta. This was the move that many of us thought would happen after Tata Martino left. Is this a case of better late than never? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we look at what happened to Atlanta. They wanted to go in a totally different direction than Tata Martino with that next hire. They went to Frank DeBoer, and it was a culture clash within that locker room. It didn't work out. And so I think the understanding here is, okay, we have a culture. We have a roster that fits these types of players and this type of let's go to South America and, and look to find that chemistry again. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense. I will say 
Heinze, from what I've been told, is not an easy personality to yep. work with. And so that will be one thing to, to really keep an eye on when he comes into this Atlanta United locker room. Again, you have Carlos Bocanegra and Darren Eels who have been running the show there and are big personalities. And now you're going to add another huge personality and maybe even a little bit more colorful and, and um, outgoing than Tata Martino was. So that will be one angle to keep an eye on if this hire is completed. Lastly, Chris Armas to D.C. I was surprised a little bit this is the direction they went. Good for Chris Armas that he gets a second chance. No, Paul? Yeah, I think I think it makes sense. Look, I think Chris Armas took a lot of heat for the way things went at the Red Bulls. But that roster has been changing a ton. The strategy behind it, they lost a lot of very good players and didn't really replace them uh, with bigger money signings. And um, I think Chris Armas is actually a really good fit in D.C. United for what they like to do. Certainly, um, I think, you know, they were always going to look domestically for a coach. And I think Chris Armas is probably the best of those options until Greg Vanny entered the fray recently. Um, and so I, I think it's a good opportunity for Armas to uh, to be in the Eastern Conference that he's very familiar with um, and to fit a franchise that I think has some pretty decent parts right now on that roster. Stu, let's bring you back in here. Let's look at the Western Conference Finals, Seattle versus Minnesota United. I thought you and John Strong were fantastic Thursday night. So I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Molino or Reynoso, who's been better? Oh, man, come on. You're asking <laughs> me to choose between two nice Cabernet wines that I like. You know, these both of these guys have been fantastic. And, and what I will say, uh, thinking about it, Kevin Molino has been lights out in the playoffs. I mean, his last three games, two goals in all of them. But Minnesota United were not the team that they are right now and challenging for the Western Conference title without Reynoso. And Reynoso, we look at playmakers across the league, teams that have been willing to spend big money on guys like Lodero. And when you talk about Reynoso, Carlos Hill, et cetera, guys that really take you to that next level. So I'm going to go with Reynoso. And that, you know, I saw you, TT, talking about Molino in a contract year. I mean, this is perfect timing for him. The fact that he's out of contract game right now performing the way that he is for Minnesota United and an opportunity really with nothing to lose going into Seattle because everybody's talking about Seattle. We're so impressed with Minnesota the other night, but everybody says, well, it's Seattle now. Minnesota have a tremendous opportunity with guys like this that are just playing free, playing. They look like they're having fun out there and ultimately they're performing. So I'm going Reynoso just, but the two of them together, they're so much fun to watch. Yeah, but I think you hit the nail on the head, which makes me want to puke, Paul. Again, that Stu and I are agreeing, which is ridiculous. But the truth is, Minnesota United already had Kevin Molino. Reynoso's come, and it's completely changed the way they can play. They can play a false nine now. It gives them a different balance. But, Stu, I got to get you and I on opposite ends, so I'm going to bring up the fact that you won two MLS Cups. I was on the other side. Congratulations. <laughs> awesome. If Seattle gets to the final, this is the better question. And better yet, they win MLS Cup. Is this the best dynasty in Major League Soccer ever? Oh, you're talking about the Houston Dynamo, uh, oh, TC. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, look, th th this Seattle Sounders team, if they win, they're obviously in the conversation with the LA Galaxy, one under Bruce Arena, with Landon and Beckham and Keane. And then also uh, going all the way back to DC United. We, we can't forget uh, and get caught in the recent history and forget about the old history when it comes to this league and what, what it was when it started. I will say if the Seattle Sounders are able to win their third MLS Cup in four years, fourth final in five years, in today's Major League Soccer, a league which is encouraging spending, a league which is spending more than has ever spent in its past, a team which a league which has more uh, teams in its league than it has ever had before, and I would say harder to win and back to back and to do it in the way that they've done it. Um, I would have to say that the Seattle Sounders, if they can win it, especially in 2020 and what 2020 has been, uh, then they will be the greatest dynasty in Major League Soccer. I agree. But, Stu, you bring up a valuable point because your Dynamo teams I'll put up against anyone that they can compete against these teams in a one-off final. But to do it in this Major League Soccer, five Years, four finals, and that's something, especially with the amount of money going in. I completely agree with you. Paul, I want to go which, to you. Which, by the way, yeah. TT, yeah. We, uh, we didn't get to the Schmetzer and Sounders here with his contract. I mean, you're letting a guy's a contract run down that could be one of the best coaches. He has the best winning percentage of any coach in Major League Soccer with over 70 games. So, you know, the fact that he hasn't been paid and you hear Vanny and you, Chris Armas, we're talking about foreign coaches as well. In many ways, these guys are now the American player and what the American player was and, and a league that's spending in foreign. 
don't forget what you have here on, on home soil. And some of these guys that have been undervalued in the past, Schmetzer needs a new contract and he needs to pay it along the best coaches in Major League Soccer. Couldn't agree more. But the only thing that matters, Stu and Paul, you guys know this better than anyone, leverage. And you have to, the, Schmetzer has to come to grips with the thought that, you know what, I might not, I, I might not be in Seattle. Do I want to leave? If he creates that leverage, he's not going anywhere because Seattle can't afford to lose him. I want to go look ahead a little bit, get ahead of ourselves, but this is the last banter show that we have for 2020. Paul, USL Salvador, uh, they come up Wednesday night before busy 2021 shows up. Give me one name you're looking at that needs to have a good game Wednesday night. This is kind of outside of the, the box in the sense of like someone you won't think of right away. But I think when you look at the competition at center back and the guys coming through, Chris Richards, we saw Matt Miazga play in the European friendlies in November. I think Aaron Long has to have a, a good mm -hmm. turn, a good run here with El Salvador because he's got to hold off Chris Richards. He's got to hold off Miazga. He's got to hold off Mark McKenzie, who's also in the camp. And if he doesn't have a strong performance after, I, I would say most people would agree, not the greatest year with the Red Bull. Uh, Red Bulls, then, um, you know, he may lose his starting job with the U.S. national team. And and I don't think it's his starting job anymore. So I, I'm going to say Aaron Long. No, that's a good look, Paul, because that's the one position that you'll hear Stu talk about. I'll talk about Alexi and others saying, well, there's depth there. Stu, there's no depth at number nine. you got to be – please tell me you're going to pick someone in this game Wednesday night <laughs> that's playing that position. Please. <laughs> Look, this is, this is I, I think, the hottest debate in, in uh, U.S. men's national team discussions. It's who's going to play number nine for this team. And, uh, you know, uh, you look at the Josies, the uh, Giassis, the Josh Sargents, but you also have two players that have done really well in Major League Soccer this year, and that's Daryl D.K. out of University of Virginia, yep. had a great year uh, for Orlando City with eight goals, and then Io Akinola, who has a huge ceiling. He scored nine goals for Toronto FC. He scored a ton of goals in MLS's back and got better and better as the year went on. Um, so these two guys, I think their first camp with Greg Berhalter, a real opportunity to, to leave a mark and say, I need to be in the mix right now for a position that is completely up for grabs. I, I don't see a guy that has said, this is my position. I'm grabbing it and I will be starting come qualifying next year. So uh, the, everybody in that position has a chance. Josh Sargent's having a, a pretty good year with Berta Bremen right now. Josie to me doesn't, you know, he had the injuries again at the end of the year. Doesn't look as motivated to be the starter for the national team. He hasn't been in camp for a bit. So Let's see. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, and I can't wait to watch these guys get an opportunity. Especially because if they do find a number nine, a starter number nine, then it's going to bring a real balance to that attack, which has so much promise coming in behind, which is where I want to go lastly before I let you guys go. The last time the United States had three players score in five major leagues, I know it's a shock to everyone because they actually, the U.S. actually had Americans playing in Europe before 2016, was actually in 2005. Brian McBride, Jermaine Jones, and Claudio Reyna did it yesterday. Weston McKinney, Christian Pulisic, Giovanni Reyna all found the back of the net. Stu, it's got to be a pretty promising time right now if you're a U.S. men's national team fan because of these guys applying their trade overseas. Yeah, you know, the only thing you have to do is either check the replies here to your show or check the replies on the USMNT uh, Twitter handle, which post uh, Kuva and post non-qualification, it was like they could have tweeted, it's a sunny day and we have a cat <laughs> outside. And they're like, oh, we hate you. You guys suck. And now it's like. Uh, oh, friendly against El Salvador. You have uh, Americans scoring in Europe, a Gio Reyna goal. I mean, it's like we're going to win the World Cup. You could not have a better sentiment right now and excitement around this team, and you should. You have some of the most promising youngsters coming through. I can't wait to see if they can put it all together because, as we all know, what does it actually look like when you get all those guys on the field at the same time but in a qualifying match, in a game that really means something? Uh, and that's what I'm excited for in 2021. Paul, Juventus, Dortmund, Chelsea. It's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's the question. Is it the golden generation or is this the beginning of U.S. soccer, the new U.S. soccer after years and years of the development academy growing and academies and investment in the youth soccer? You know, are we going to start to see more and more players that migrate to Europe at a younger age and are able to move up through the ranks and into the bigger teams? Right now, you, you say golden generation. But in a few years, if we start to see more of these moves, Brendan Aronson, now you see interest in Brian Reynolds in Dallas, maybe we're talking about that change in U.S. soccer that we've always been waiting for. 
Gentlemen, I appreciate everything you've done in 2020. You've obviously kept me engaged, but more importantly, the fans around here. Stu, good luck the rest of the way with Fox starting Monday night in Seattle and then Saturday with MLS Cup. And Paul, make sure you keep all of us engaged during the winter break. Now, you can't take time off. We can. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, the MLS offseason is about one day long now <laughs> for us, so I'm used yeah. to it. Have a, have a good call, TT. Pizardes. And he scored. Jazzy Zardes has made it 3-1 to Columbus. Jazzy Zardes into the penalty area. And there is the finish from Pedro Santos. Zardes has split the defense again. Jazzy Zardes is throw and finishes. Swift and lethal. Don't look now, but the man probably best suited to lead the attack for the U.S. men's national team heading into World Cup qualifying could be that guy, the Columbus Crew Zone Giazzi Zardes. We caught up with him yesterday to talk MLS playoffs, the U.S. men's national team, and whether or not he feels underappreciated in the soccer community. Giazzi, thanks for taking the time. I know there's a, uh, a huge game on Sunday, so I appreciate it. Let's start with that. It's been an interesting 10 months, 2020. It's been a very, very confusing year to try to wrap all of this together and yet you're in the Eastern Conference final. Are you surprised at all? No, you know, um, like you said, it's just been a crazy, a crazy year. You know, we started off the season, played two games, and the next thing you know, we're off for a couple of months. Um, but, you know, it's no mistake that, that we're in the conference final because once we went down to Orlando after, uh, you know, the coronavirus hit, uh, we were a solid team down there. I think the only team to, to win all three, three games in the, the group play. And at that moment, I knew we had something special this year. So talk about last year, which was a very, very difficult year for Columbus, not for you necessarily. Then to that transition this year, from your point of view, what's been the biggest difference? Yeah, so like you said, from my point of view, um, the difference is the, the players we picked up in the offseason. You know, we, we picked up Darlington Nagby. We picked up Lucas Zellerayan. We also picked up a couple of key elements on, on, on the wings, you know, uh, um, Ima Boateng, Derek Etienne. So we have a couple of attacking pieces and attacking threats that helped us this year. You're going up against New England. You're going up against Bruce Arena. You know, it wasn't that long ago you were a young kid coming into Major League Soccer, and a lot of that was under Bruce Arena and that tutelage in L.A. Is it going to be weird going up against them? Yeah, you know, uh, I believe this is my first time going up against them. But, uh, you know, I'm excited because he has the New England Revolution firing on all cylinders. So it's going to be great just to play against a team like that uh, for the final. So when you score against the revolution on Sunday, is there any part of you that's going to go over to Bruce and say, I told you I should have played number nine. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, he, he, know, he knows I'm a number nine, but also uh, he knows my work rate and my engine. That's why he played me on the wing sometime. But I think they see it now uh, that my true position is up top. <laughs> I, I actually hope I get to see that, quite honestly. Uh, just talk about your evolution as a nine, Jazzy. I, I, I am on the record saying you don't get enough credit, uh, mainly not because you're scoring goals, but because you've worked really, really hard with your first touch, your hold-up play, your link play. Just talk about that kind of evolution in your game. Yeah, you know, like you said, early on in my career, um, I played on the wings uh, majority of the time, but – you know, I've, I've always been a striker. And over the years, like you said, as I improved up uh, on my hold-up play, um, also getting into the box, you know, I think the most important thing of, uh, or the most uh, the key asset that I have is my runs in the box, you know, um, just staying on the, on the blind side of the defender and them not knowing where I'm running to is allowing me to free up space and, and, and score the goals that I, I am scoring. And, and also, you know, my, my first touches um, over the years have gotten better as well, you know, um, which happens as a pro. Um, when you come into the league, you're adapting to the speed of play. And I feel like uh, I've turned into a, a great striker and I'm still constantly motivated to, to keep working hard. You know, I'm never satisfied with, with the goals I'm scoring or, or, you know, the games we're winning. I always want more and I always want to do whatever I can um, to train and, and, and improve and, and become a better striker. Do you feel underappreciated? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I really, to be honest, I really don't focus on, uh, on what other people say, if they're not my coaches or my teammates, um, whether they praise me or, or whether they say uh, he's not good enough, I don't worry about that because at the end of the day, I'm the one on the field playing. 
you know, and I'm the one on the field scoring. So the most important thing is, is what my coaches think of me and what my, my teammates think of me. <laughs> and I think in, in, in Jazzy, you laugh, but that's very true because very rarely do you ever hear a critical thing said about you from any of your managers, from any of your teammates. It's just all of us on the outside, us chuckleheads <laughs> that have comments. And I think that's understated. I don't think people recognize that true importance. I'm just curious from your perspective, is there anyone you try to e e emulate and watch and try to evolve as that number nine? Yeah. So it, it just, uh, to be honest, it depends on what my coach is asking me, you know, certain games I have to drop in and, uh, and, you know, have the ball at my feet more. So sometimes I like to watch Firmino, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as the week goes on, if I have to be a key element, sometimes if I'm making, if I'm making runs in the box, um, you know, I, I can watch players like, uh, you know, Suarez or uh, Lewandowski, mm -hmm. You know, they're real clinical in the box. So it just it just depends on what my coaches are asking, asking of me um, that week or um, depending on the opponent we're playing. And I try to emulate my game uh, of a striker that, that does those runs or do the things yeah. that I'm trying to do. New England's won two straight road games in the playoffs. They're looking for their third. If there's one thing you guys have to do in order to win the game, what is that? I think it's preventing uh, Gil and uh, Boa uh, from getting the ball at the top of the box and shooting or just uh, prevent them from finding rhythm because those, t those two guys, ever since they've been back with the New England Revolution, have been, uh, you know, key players for their team. And if they get going, they can be real dangerous. But if you don't allow them to get into the game, I think, uh, I think we should have a good opportunity at winning at home. Jazzy, it's very weird uh, year as we've talked about, but more so when you look at international play, the U.S. men's national team just played two friendlies last month. Here they're going to have a game in December. Is it odd that the next game you play for the United States may be a World Cup qualifier minus that January camp? Uh, yeah, like you said, you know, the, the scheduling has been weird, but um, at the same time, you know, we're, we're still in uh, contact with the U.S. men's national team coaches. You know, we – we have communication on, on, on WhatsApp uh, throughout the year. So they're always keeping all the player pool, uh, the player pool, you know, they're keeping us up to date with how things are going. Uh, and so the biggest thing is if you get called into camp, it's just about adapting and, and, and quickly learning um, the game plan or I should say uh, whatever they ask of you. Jazzy, I thank you uh, a ton for joining us and more so I've just been a huge fan of your evolution your humility, your professionalism, and also that little chip on your shoulder every single time one of us chuckleheads question whether or not you can score goals. Good luck, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. You guys have a good one. Takes a shot instead and buries it from downtown. Tejon spanks it into the back of the net. Now Buchanan for the first shot again in the second, and it's getting better and better for the New England Revolution. They started moving players around, and one of those players was Buchanan to right back, and he's brought a different element to this team. Now, along with the return of Carlos Hill, the emergence of Tejan Buchanan over the past few months has made the Revs a very dangerous team in the Eastern Conference. We caught up with Tejan earlier in the week and talked about that move to right back and also what it's like playing behind an NMLS great, Carlos Hill. Tejan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know it's a busy week prepping for the game against Columbus. Um... Just go through the last month or so for you. It's been a very interesting, exciting time for you, making the switch to right back. How big of a surprise was that for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, the last month has been, you know, a lot of ups and downs for sure. Um, you know, I started playing wing, uh, kind of had my spot on my right side. And then, you know, Carlos comes back healthy and, uh, you know, Bruce kind of just takes me aside. And a few guys went down with injuries and, you know, other stuff in, in this period of time. So he says, uh, yeah, we're going to play you uh, uh, right back. Uh, I trained there a lot last season uh, throughout that time. So I was a little used to it, but, you know, never in an MLS match I've I played right back before. So, you know, from there it was just, you know, getting comfortable, you know. And throughout that, you know, the teammates have been great with that. Uh, they've been helping me a lot. You know, guys like Andrew Farrell, Matt Polster, Brandon By that, that, that has played right back uh, mm -hmm. has helped me along the way and, you know, when you have a guy like Carlos that plays in front of me, he makes things a lot easier. So I've been enjoying it. You know, I think I like it a lot now. You know, it gives me the freedom to go forward. So, you know, I'm enjoying it. And I'm extremely happy with, you know, how we're doing right now in the playoffs. 
I think that's always interesting as a player when certain things you're like, no, nah, I'll never do that. And now all of a sudden you do it, you become comfortable with it. And quite honestly, uh, you look very comfortable with that early switch. Now, just talk about Carlos playing in front of you. Mm-hmm. He's a special player. You guys are a completely different team with him. Is he one of the best players you've ever played with? Definitely. I think he is the best player I've ever played with. Uh, you know what he does on the ball. But, you know, what he does off the ball also, you know, usually, you know, your best players, you don't want defending that much. You know, they don't they don't need to because, you know, they do special things going forward. But, you know, Carlos, he does, you know, both sides of the game. And then, you know, like like we all see in games, you know, you give that guy the ball, you know, he makes special things happen. And, you know, having him play in front of me, you know, when I when I get when I give him the ball and when other players give him the ball, you know, it just gives me the freedom because uh, so many players just he, he attracts so many players. And, you know, I'm just bombing for it at that point. Uh, part of that bombing forward, we saw that against Orlando City. I'm just curious, how much trash talking was going on with you and Kamal Miller, your former teammate of yours in college? <laughs> Honestly, there is no trash talk. Uh, you know, we talked before the game and, you know, we were just having a laugh. But, you know, once we got on the field, uh, I was kind of just playing my game. He was playing his game. And, uh, you know, there is, there is nothing really, uh, really into that. Uh, you know, that's my good friend from home. So it was just nice to be able to play against him and, you know, see him again. Yeah, it's crazy. Who would have thought when you two were at Syracuse that all of a sudden you would have been playing for the right to be in the Eastern Conference Final. Let's move to the Eastern Conference Final. Columbus, you guys haven't played since Bruce has taken over. You haven't played him, obviously, in 2020 because of the pandemic and and procure your uh, schedule or whatnot. How do you Mm -hmm. prepare for a game like this? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, going, going over film, you know, looking at their, you know, their key players and stuff like that. But you know, also just worrying about us. And, you know, if we play our game, you know, we're going to we're gonna be in the best position to win this game. But, you know, we got to re- respect them. They've been doing well all season. They have great players and, you know, a great forward, Zardes. So, you know, we just got to, you know, uh, pretty much just take a step back, you know, go over film and, you know, follow what the coaching, the coaching staff has for us and, uh, you know, just really play our game. Tejan, the game against Orlando, I said you guys aren't a traditional eight seed because if Carlos Hill and Gustavo Bo were healthy for the entire year, you guys would have been a top three seed, in my opinion, in mm. the Eastern Conference. Is there that belief in that locker room that now with everyone healthy, you guys may be the best team in the Eastern Conference? Yeah, I, I, you know, all, all year, you know, we always believed we we're we we're a top team and, you know, through ups and downs, you know, losing some of our key players, it's been it's been tough, but. Yeah, you know, now in these games, we've proven that, you know, we, we took down, uh, you know, the Supporters Shields champions uh, in, in Philadelphia Union and Orlando. They're an excellent team. They've done great this year. And, you know, we we're able to give them a battle. So, yeah, the, you know, the guys are buzzing right now. And, uh, you know, we're confident that we could we could win this game on Sunday and, and, and win MLS Cup. Tejan, I appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck Sunday. We'll uh, catch up in the future, all right? I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Now let's welcome in John Champion. We had a pretty good show early on. John, Stu Holden, Paul Tenorio. We also had Tejan Buchanan and Giazzi Zardes. I want to go back to something that both, it caught me by surprise, and I'm a little stunned, that Stu and Paul said, unequivocally, they said New England are favored in this. Do you agree with that? No, no. But equally, if you were to say, does that mean you think Columbus are favorite? The answer is also no, because I think this is too close to call for me. I think Columbus are... Marginally the better unit as a mm-hmm. team. I think they've got more factors. So Zellerayan, Zardes, Nagby, I think is excellent in his position. I think Mensa's had an outstanding season at the back. I think Pedro Santos is a craftsman, yep. uh, whether he plays as a 10 or off the left-hand side. Whereas set against that, you've got New England with these two stellar talents in mm-hmm. Carlos Hill particularly, and then also Gustavo Bo. But then there is a downside to New England, which is you look at the back four, not convinced. Look at the two central midfield players, Coldwell and Polster. Not convinced by them either. So I just think there are more reasons to believe in Columbus. Yeah, and I think where Stu and Paul were coming from, which you said in our last broadcast, is that it's been very apparent in these MLS Cup playoffs, if your DP show up and mm. play well, you win. Now, that's been the case for New England. Where I'm stuck on New England, John, Polster and Caldwell, Kessler and Farrell. Those are your two partnerships that's got to hold the fort down. And neither of those says to me real confidence that they can stop Artur, Nagby, Zellerayen, Zardes. That's why I look at it and say, well, wait a minute. I think think New England's playing a little bit with house money. They're on the road. I I think Columbus is favored in this. Now, the counteracting argument to that, for me anyway, is that a week ago we could have sat here. Well, we did sit here. 
But we could have sat and discussed this more specifically and we could have said, instead of those names that you've just reeled off, can New England control Zelarayan Zardes, we could have been saying DK, Nani, yes, we could have. Pereira. So I think the same arguments apply. And for me, the, the X factor in all of this is the fact that Bruce Arena yep. is such a course and distance specialist when it comes to the pragmatic tail end of the season. And that's where we are and that's where he comes alive. And I think Caleb Porter prides himself in trying to follow those footsteps the way Bruce Arena started in college, won, went into the uh, Major League Soccer, the pro ranks. Now Bruce had success with the men's national team, also a massive failure with the U.S. men's national team. But Caleb's also looked up to that, and he almost tries to build his teams around that, which is going to be an interesting matchup. But which coach has more to lose today, Caleb or Bruce? Um, I think Bruce because Agreed. there aren't too many more chances for him. Couldn't agree more. John Champion, Taylor Twelman, we will be with you momentarily on ABC 3 o'clock Eastern as the Columbus crew and 1,500 fans, you bet it, they've got fans today, crew host the revolution for the right for the MLS Cup Final on December 12th.